This episode of Warp 5 is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 150,000 titles for your smartphone, tablet, or desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. Also, help us keep Star Trek discussion coming to you each day by becoming a Trek FM patron through Patreon. Get access to exclusive content and become part of the team. You'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm. Hi, I'm Anthony Montgomery, Ensign Travis Mayweather on Star Trek Enterprise, and you're listening to Trek FM. Welcome, Boomers, to another episode of Warp 5, Trek FM's dedicated enterprise show. I'm your host, Floyd Dorsey, and I just received a cryptic message a short time ago from Melodic Trek's host, Brandon Shea Matala, telling me to meet him in a very unusual place. So I've got to tell you, I'm here I am, I'm standing in a damp, dark, foggy alleyway in a shady part of our future San Francisco, and uh, wait a minute, uh, there he is. There's Brandon. Brandon, why in the world are we meeting here and not in the Admiral's office or on board the Enterprise? Shh, 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 shh. Too loud, man. We gotta be quiet. This is a secret place here, okay? Oh, oh, we're 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 supposed to be whispering. Yeah, this oh, okay. is like this is this is some secret stuff here, okay? We got some uh, so information what, on what's the secret. What what's going on? What have you got me into here? So tonight we've got an interview with Harris from Section Thirty One. Eric Pierpoint. Okay. Okay. Well, um, let's just. I don't. Do you know him? How did you? How did you get contacted with him? Like, like what? What happened? I just. I was talking into my computer, and I was just getting frustrated about a couple of things, saying I needed help, and all of a sudden, my computer just started talking to me, and saying, you know, all these weird glitchy files came up and said, you know what, meet me here in this alley. So, I mean, I after that, I put tape oh. over my. Uh, over my video camera thing. Oh, great, great. You've got me mixed in with a Section 31 agent. Thanks a lot. I'm sorry, man. But, I mean, he said I had to bring Floyd. Okay, well, when he gets here, you do you you go ahead and introduce me then because <laughs> I'm going to – that way I can at least have some deniability going on, all right? But uh, I got to say I'm, I'm very, very excited that we got this interview with Eric Pierpoint tonight. I mean, this is – this guy's had a career that's uh, you know spanned several decades. He's done many different roles. He's done. Uh, he was uh, George Francisco on Alien Nation, and he's been on Matlock. What else has he been on? Parks and Rec. Late, lately, he's been on CSI. He's been on Hill Street Blues way back in the day, and of course, he's been on every Star Trek series after the original series. So this guy, he has been, he know he's been around the block a little bit here with Star Trek. He knows what's going on. So maybe we can all build a time machine and then he can go back in time and we can get him actually on the original series with William Shatner and then he can just be on all of them. Wow. That would be, that would be the home run, definitely touching all the bases kind of a thing for the actor if he could do that. But yeah, um, he pl- actually played two actors or he had two roles on enterprise then some people might not realize he was on rogue planet as Sherat, one of the hunters that was looking for the wraith and then of course the the most recognizable role is agent harris what you said he which was the first episode he's on you said he was on the new star wars rogue one uh no 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 not not quite oh that's yeah it was rogue planet oh okay (laughs) <laughs> yeah so we don't, we don't want to get people uh too around there but you know he might he said he was working on something he can't talk about so you know he might show up there too do i hear the transporter beaming in our guest now okay well you you just go ahead and introduce me then and we'll get to, we'll we'll you we'll get started from there and joining us today is 
Eric Pierpoint, a very famous actor who's done numerous roles in film and television. How are you doing today, Eric? I'm great, Brandon. How are you doing? I'm doing absolutely fantastic. Uh, first, I just want to start by saying thank you very much for taking the time to, to talk to us today about your acting and, as we'll get into, your writing career as well. Sure, thank you. And we're on with Floyd as well, right? Yep. Yeah, we got Floyd here. Okay. <laughs> so, so, yeah, yeah, you didn't lose me. You didn't lose Better me. Better to wake you up there, Floyd. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. <laughs> okay. So your, your first film credited on uh, IMDb is Windy City from 1984. How did you get into acting, and how has the audition process changed over the years? Well, okay. It's, um, the way I got into it is I, uh, was a, in, I was in college, if you want to go back that far, uh, which is pretty far. And I really began my, my life on stage. I felt very attracted to that. And when I got out of undergrad school, I kind of went away from it for a few years. But then I went back to graduate school to study uh, classical theater and get a master's degree. So after doing probably 50 or 60 plays and all kinds of different things in the Washington, D.C. area, I ended up in New York City. And I was in a play actually back in D.C., going back and forth. I was living in New York. And I got a call uh, from um, a casting director named Diane Crittenden. And she said to me that I, I saw you do this uh, commercial spot. And I thought, you know, if you could do that, I need to see you. We're casting this new movie. Can, can you come up? So I flew up and read for um, uh, uh, the part. And it was sort of like a, um, oh, uh, how can I say, like um, a big chill kind of a movie. You know, a bunch of guys in their 30s trying to figure life out. And... Uh, as I was heading to the elevator after the audition, uh, the casting assistant came running as the elevator doors were, were closing. And they said, they, they really liked you, but can you come back and read a different part? And so I came back and read a different part. Well, I went back and forth. I ended up reading probably about five different parts. And I think I broke them down. And uh, eventually they gave me a part I never read for. Uh, and so that kind of kicked everything off. And then what happens in this business is once you, once you get something like that, then people start talking about it and they want to know who the new person is. And, uh, so while that was going on, I was being tested, flown out from New York on, um, uh, you know, did screen tests for various uh, television projects. And, uh, that's something they hardly ever do anymore. Uh, you know, and so much, much of it now is uh, digital. But back then, you had to be in the room uh, in person. And we're getting such good feedback, and I got close to a couple of things, that um, I decided that uh, I would stay out in California. And I lived at the Chateau Marmont Hotel for two months as Windy City uh, was in post-production. So we shot Windy City. And now I then land a, a pilot uh, that turned into a series for NBC called Hot Pursuit, which was about uh, you know, sort of a, like a fugitive type of show, action sort of uh, love affair show, uh, husband and wife on the run uh, from the law. And uh, so I established some great relationships from that. And um, over the course of the years, uh, the executive producer, uh, Ken Johnson, uh, of Hot Pursuit went on to do uh, a lot of other things that I was in as well as uh, Alien Nation and he also had been executive producer on things like on shows like uh, Bionic Woman and Six Million Dollar Man and Incredible Hulk and, and uh, he wrote uh, V so that's kind of what the kickoff for the television and film career started with uh, uh, Windy City more or less and has just been going since then. And you asked me about right. the audition process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, most of the time in the past, if you auditioned for something, you would have uh, producers and directors and sometimes writers in the room with you. And for some shows, you still do. But I would say 80% of the time, 
uh, if you've been, if your agent has called you and said you've got a meeting on something like tomorrow, I'm going in on uh, a Seth MacFarlane project. And, you know, you're in there uh, these days, almost always with the casting director and maybe a casting assistant and a camera. And most of the time that's it. And they send the, uh, you know, they tape it, you know, record it and they'll send it to uh, the director and the producer. And then it gets sent on to the network or the studio. So you're kind of removed oftentimes from uh, the creative people and you're kind of there with casting directors that you've mostly known, you know, over the years as I've, I, as I have. So that's one thing that's changed. Another thing that's changed is that if they decide not to have a session or if they're, let's say in Canada, they'll say, uh, can you put yourself on tape, you know, and send it. So here you are in your living room with your iPhone and, you know, kind of recording yourself and then uh, emailing it off to wherever it goes. Uh, and that's something that, of course, never, you know, but now people are doing movies on iPhone. So who knows? So you still have to do auditions? People aren't just throwing scripts at you now, Eric? Uh, I wish they would. <laughs> uh, I did. I, I actually, uh, as ironically, uh, you know, that you should say this. My neighbor, um, is a director of photography. He's done a lot of big movies. And uh, he he knocked on my door uh, this morning and he said, uh, what are you doing Friday? Uh, can you, uh, we're, we're shooting this commercial that Rob Lowe is uh, going to do. And uh, can you do it? And I, he said, I said, what? And he says, yeah, Alex, uh, Alex Graves, who has directed Game of Thrones, uh, West Wing and all kinds of different things. Uh, so Alex is directing it and we want you to play the part of the director of the commercial. So I said, uh, okay. <laughs> so I mean, how, how weird that is, you know, we're at each other's barbecues. So I, I just thought it was great. And that's kind of the thing that I'm negotiating right now is a combination of, of a job that is doing, doing something on Friday, which is actually my birthday, you know, cause I had to like cancel other things as well as uh, have a barbecue for the same people on Sunday. So that's a freaky thing. You have, you have a very impressive IMBD page. I mean, you've been on several uh, popular films, Liar Liar, Transformers 2, and also some really great television shows like Parks and Rec, uh, CSI, uh, Star Trek, and Alien Nation. So on Alien Nation, you played George Francisco. Uh, what was it like playing a character that had been established by another actor? And how did you make that role your own? You know, uh, I've, uh, there's a little bit of history in that. And Alien Nation will probably remain as, you know, unless something else comes along that where I'm in, in that absorbed and, and uh, challenged by uh, one of my all-time favorite uh, projects. And Ken Johnson, who I just mentioned, uh, as having been uh, one of the first uh, producers in LA I worked with, uh, he called me up and he said, I want you, uh, I'm, I've been asked to do uh, uh, alien nation television series and I want you to be in it. And, um, I said, well, yeah, I've seen it. You know, I, I went and I saw Mandy Patinkin and James Conn and I thought the, I, the whole setup was great. I thought, uh, you know what, it, it, that was kind of a, a highly anticipated, uh, film back in 19, I guess, 87 or eight or whenever it was, uh, because a lot of that stuff was fairly new. So I, I said, well, let me look at it again. So I went out and I rented it and I thought, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, James Conn, you know, did this and whatever. And I was thinking that he was asking me to play the James Conn role, Sykes role. And so I said, yeah, Kenny, I mean, you know, I'd, I'd love to, you know, give, do it. I'd love, you know, I thought James, he said, no, 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 I, I want you to play George Francisco. I said, what, the alien? <laughs> and he says, absolutely, because the way I know you, I think it's a great fit. And I said, well, let me look at it again. So I went back and I got it and I looked at it and I went, oh, absolutely. And the reason for me was, there's a, a certain kind of 
liberation or freedom, believe it or not, when you, when you put it on this makeup, uh, where you begin to lose uh, your own ego, you're not as attached to your own ego as if you're, you know, when you're playing a leading, a leading man, let's say. And so you, you get to explore all of these other aspects of yourself, but yet to try to keep it real. Uh, but once you get the makeup on, then you begin to kind of figure out, you know, where everything is coming from. It's not like you're just throwing on a head and you're just you, you know, you just try to blend all of these things together. But the other thing that made that work so much for me was I, uh, having studied a lot of, uh, you know, classical theater and Shakespeare and, and British comedy and whatever, as well as American classics and dramas, you could, I mean, he's an alien. Who's to say you can't go from this to that, you know, make these extreme kinds of, uh, changes. Uh, so I felt going to work every day was a huge, uh, challenge, but such, uh, a great experience. And, you know, like Gary Graham, who uh, played the Sykes character in Alien Nation, and we would play opposites. You know, it's like, if he's like this, I'm like that. If I'm like that, he's like this, you know. So it's, it, 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 it was a bit of a, um, uh, I don't know, a, a, there were ways that we could, uh, you know, still be a uh, partners, you know, cops but be very very opposite but somehow the dance worked and uh uh you know those were if we didn't laugh every day it would be torture because as star trek people know when you're in makeup and you're in makeup every day and you're there at three o'clock in the morning you also better be having a good time because it's it's difficult it's stressful because the the app you know the the makeup and the glue and everything is on your face and after, and it itches and it's hot and you're sweating uh so there's there are certain very there are a lot of challenges and if you're doing it every day it builds up uh if you if you're a recurring role or a guest star you know you're kind of you've got some time off uh but i think that creatively uh if you're you know if you really have a great character that you can explore it makes those hours uh, pass a lot quicker. What was the prosthetics that they used? Did they just use some kind of a rubber thing to put over your head to cover your hair? Yeah, what what it was was uh, first they take a mold. Uh, so they do a plaster, I guess, a, a mold of your of your head. And uh, w- then they take that off. So they have this, like of your face, for example, and then they will sculpt it. And then they will... Uh, you know, they'll do a, uh, uh, prosthetic, uh, a pouring. And so they have the, the main, uh, head that they use, and then they can almost, you know, create, uh, a lot of different, uh, almost like caps for you. So with the way it worked with me is that the piece went right under the, both eyelids and cut down the side of each side of my face and then around back so that it covered covers your hair and it has had little, you know, ear holes for your ears. And, um, so that, you know, it, it was very confining, uh, and annoying. Uh, (laughs) but on the other hand, uh, it made, made it work. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, if you're playing a Klingon, which I played, uh, I remember I was sitting in the chair at two forty five or so a, you know, for the first shot to be at six thirty because they, I'm sure they had other Klingons to do and they got to get all the people ready for a first shot. Uh, and that was a, a fairly long process because they're, you know, it's just like, if you're doing a guest star as a Klingon, then they are going to try to do as much custom for you as you can. Like they'll take a mold, of, they'll take like a mold of your, of your mouth, of your teeth, give you a, uh, you know, some fake teeth, uh, and other, other things. And, um, you know, uh, of course when you're playing, if you're doing Star Trek, I mean, you gotta be a Klingon at some point. I mean, don't you? 
<laughs> sure. Okay. Well, you mentioned being a Klingon, and you appear, you have actually appeared on every Star Trek series after the original. So you were on TNG, you were on DS9, you were on Barge of the Dead. That's uh, You played Kortar on Barge of the Dead on Voyager. And so were you actually a fan of Star Trek before you got your first part on TNG, or was it just... I was a fan of Star Trek uh, when I was in college, which was 1969 to 1973, okay? And when I was – Star Trek, what, first aired in like 66 or something? Is that right? Or seven or – 66. Okay. Okay. So I was not a fan when it first came out. However, when I got to be a freshman in college and I learned – how to be a freshman in college and what that meant going from being a, uh, a, an athlete, a jock to college where you learned all kinds of things that were bad for you. And, uh, one, one of the things that we always did, uh, I had a roommate who was into a lot more things than I was, uh, in terms of, you know, acid rock. And, uh, you know, he had all of the toys. He had the reel to reel tape going. He had, the Christmas lights in the, you know, going, you know, to his music and stuff. And by God, there was a certain smell in the area. And so, you know, you just, you kind of go with it. And he had a, 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 uh, like a, a nine inch black and white TV. And he watched Star Trek. Uh, they were, Star Trek was on every night in a rerun I think around six o'clock or something like that, or seven o'clock at night. And I, I kept saying, like, what, what do you get it? What is it? She says, you got to sit down and watch this. So I started watching it and I, I got hooked and I thought, Oh my God, what is this? What, this is fantastic. I can't believe what they're doing. Oh my, you know, because it was so fresh and different and I had never really uh, had the time or didn't really care about watching it. And I really, I, and then he looked at me at one point and he said, wouldn't it be great if you were in a show like that? <laughs> so I thought, yeah, and I didn't think anything of it. Um, so we watched it. Uh, we were roommates for about four, for the whole four years. And I began, you know, my acting career kind of as a, you know, a senior in college is just going into the theater department. And I, I'll say that it was it was somewhat responsible for getting me interested because I began to be a lot more interested in these kinds of, uh, you know, characters and these kinds of ideas. So, uh, that, that was interesting to have that happen. And then going through the alien nation, uh, you know, when alien nation uh, aired and then it was over, they were, uh, casting next generation. So within, I guess, uh, when did, when did next gen, first era was that like 91 or two 87 yeah was 87 87 yep yeah. i'll be darn okay so i guess that happened i must have gone in uh that's odd I, I didn't have that right um i must have gone in before alien nation then uh they saw me as uh the riker for the riker character Ooh. i have to say that would be really cool you know so Oh, it would have been really a lot of fun, but I, but I ended up uh, playing um, uh, the ambassador of love, uh, of all, I believe it is. Yeah. Uh, for that, where where when I got this the script, they you know I I said wait I I turn into a woman. <laughs> how are they, how are they going to do that? I'm trying to think about that. I'm thinking uh, I I don't think I'd make a very good looking woman. So. Then, of course, they double casted. They had uh, Barbara Williams to play me as I turned into a woman to investigate uh, the concept of love with uh, the Picard with Picard and uh, fell, you know, flat on my face in terms of I didn't get anywhere and I felt like I failed. And then uh, after, you know, I turned back from her back into me. Um, So I thought, okay, you know, so. After all of that, uh, the, each Star Trek along the way, I remember they saw me um, uh, when they were doing, I guess, what was, let's see, Deep Space. Uh, they were looking for the captain. And by that time, uh, both uh, Gary Graham and I uh, were, I can't remember if he was called in for that, but I went in to audition for uh, 
uh, Avery Brooks part. And then we were told that, no, they were going to go with uh, Avery Brooks. And I thought, oh, of course, you know, Star Trek, they should. And then um, when Voyager came out, there, were, there was a, a bit of a kerfuffle there with trying to figure out uh, casting. Um, and Kate Mulgrew ended up with a role after, uh, who's it, Genevieve Bourgeau? Yep, Genevieve Bourgeau, yep. Yeah, okay. And she, uh, uh, I think, left the part. So they, there was a brief moment when they were trying to figure out whether they were going to uh, recast with a woman or a man. I don't know if you guys know that. Did you ever hear that part? I heard that story, yeah. Yeah, okay. So once again, <clears throat> I was in the room. And uh, so they ended up with, uh, with her. And okay. So then I find myself as, uh, you know, I didn't get Avery Brooks' part, but I got to play a captain and have my ship shot out from under me. Captain Sanders, and then and then I got to play uh, Cortar and be on Captain of the Barge of the Dead on the River of Blood. That was very cool. So at least each step along the way, I'm not getting that big thing, but they are giving me stuff, right? <laughs> so I've always had this great relationship with the Star Trek people. I always loved it. Always loved doing them. Uh, and then eventually with Enterprise. Um, uh, to go on and uh, play a character who uh, three hunters on a, a hunting intelligent game on the, I guess the dark planet, uh, which I remember actually, I think that was a, like an old either outer limits or twilight zone uh, concept. Did uh, you guys remember that? Oh, I, I've ne- I didn't never heard of that. Yeah. I, I believe uh, the story is based on uh, or was a, a similar story as to, uh, you know, another sci-fi show. I'm not sure which one it was. Uh, you, maybe your, your listeners uh, know exactly you know, what it was. Uh, but of uh, hunters and in t- uh, hunting intelligent game and uh, aliens hunting intelligent game. So it was like a, a real moral dilemma. And when I, after I finished that show, uh, and I had a great time on that, doing that, uh, they called me back in because uh, they were considering me uh, for another Klingon role. Uh, Obviously not the same. And so when I got in to meet with, uh, you know, the producers, uh, they started looking at each other and they said, uh, hang on. Now, we know you've already played a Klingon. We have this other uh, part. Would you mind taking the script out and looking at it for a while and coming back in and reading this for us? It's, he's human. And, uh, you know, it's this sort of secret kind of like recurring role of a guy named Harris. And that's what happened. I went out for uh, you know 20 minutes or so and came back in and read it and then next thing i know i'm that's what i'm doing on enterprise uh and i had a great time on that opposite uh dominic uh and uh so you know it's it's sort of this whole relationship for many many years that i've had with uh science fiction and and star trek it's been a really terrific experience for me I've got to say, you, you've appeared on Enterprise twice. First, you were Sherat on Rogue Planet. That's where you were the hunter. And you were the Section 31 agent as Harris. So it, it seems like they just like keeping you in dark settings. You know, you're, you're hanging out in dark planet <laughs> yeah. hunt, hunting. And they got you in a dark <laughs> yeah, planet. on the barge. Right? Yeah. I, you know, whatever. I'm, it, and maybe, you know, whatever happens with the next... Uh, you know, the next version of, of Star Trek, who knows, you know, maybe they'll bring me back as an ancient wizard. <laughs> well, it's, it's the new show is only, it's, it's about a hundred years after and after Enterprise, right? It takes place just before the original series. So maybe we could see an elder Harris again. Uh, yeah, really, really old Harris. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, you're, you're section 31, so you can do all kinds of stuff. I can do whatever I want. Right. Right. So yeah, okay. uh, how much did you know about uh, section 31's CD past or the type of role before you filmed it? Did you know anything about section 31? Absolutely nothing. I didn't know anything. Uh, I knew a vague, I, I had a vague idea of what it was. Uh, 
I was actually filled in by a security guard on the set, if you can believe that. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So one of the guards on the set, and I, I was um, uh, getting ready to get in there, and you know, I've been asking it, and I went through hair, and I went through makeup, and I'm, you know, wardrobe and all that, and he said, so what do you know? And I said, I really don't know how you, well, let me fill you in. He started to talk to me about it. Uh, and then as you, you start to get more because they, I did not get like, sometimes you might get a Bible or something, right. Uh, where you've got all of this, uh, information, but sometimes also casting works pretty quick where you don't get a lot of backstory. You don't get a lot of information. Uh, so, you know, as an actor, you, you're trying to take things as much information you, as you get and, you know, incorporate it as quickly as you can into your thought process. And, uh, uh, hopefully, you, hopefully you make bloody sense at the end of the day, right? Uh, but you know the way they had that set up and the way they did it, you know, it was it worked. You know, it worked. You know, it's good to go back and and do you know a number of them. And um, when uh, you know, uh, I know that there was another actor who had uh, had been doing this before. Maybe you guys can fill me in on it. Well, we had, there was a, it originally started on Star Trek: D Space Nine uh, in season six. And uh, I'm drawing a blank as to the actor's name. I can look it up right now. But uh, it was brought in right near the end of D-Space Nine's run. And so it was quite interesting to see it brought up in Enterprise as the prequel show that this Section 31 has been around since the beginning. Yeah. Well, you know as much as I do. It was, uh, it was uh, Agent Sloan, and it was played by William Sadler. Thank you. Well, they, and they tried to put me into his costume. Yes. <laughs> And it didn't work very well. I apparently, uh, you know, he was a, a, a thinner than I was. And uh, it was pretty funny because, it, you know, at one point I'm try, trying on his uh, uh, leather suit, which was basically, a, you know, like leather pants and, you know, whatever, leather <laughs> jacket or something. And I can't get in. And so he, he, he <laughs> costume brings out a truss. And I'm not fat, but you know, he did, you know, but because they were also ending their season uh, or ending the show, and they don't really want to spend any more money on a new suit, right? Mm -hmm. So they made it work by you know trying to split seams and stuff. And one of the things that was funny was it was hard to move in it, and when I did move, I squeaked a lot. <laughs> so what became part of the character is he didn't move much. <laughs> Right. So, so you're saying you're playing a sneaky section 130, you're a section 31 agent, but you my can't. leather suit was too tight. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't sneak I mean, up on anybody? Facetious, but it was true. Right. <laughs> Something your fans don't know a whole lot about. Well, I, I've got to say, I mean, having, having, uh, you know, communicate going on with section 31 agent here, Brandon, I'm, I'm a little, I don't, I don't know, man. I feel like we need to be looking, watching over our shoulders after this, you know? But um, I've We're got to say, I, since since I have been since we have a contact with a Section Thirty One agent, I've got to say, next time that you requisition something from your quartermaster, you need to talk to him about maybe changing that uniform. You know, the black leather, it's kind of it, it to be secret. It kind of stands out quite a bit, and I'm I'm sure you would have appreciated it if it had. Well, been. you know what? Uh, when you're in dark light and you're being very dramatic, I guess you can get away with that. Uh, and that's what they did, you know, and it, you know, super secret, you know, stealth man, right. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, this who squeaks. Yep. <laughs> so a question about the role. So as a Star Trek fan and, you know, you've been in each of the Star Trek, uh, television shows since the original, how do you feel about them bringing in this concept of this seedy, dark underbelly to Starfleet? Well, why not? Uh, you know, they're, I think it, it just adds, uh, you know, a great other color to an ongoing television series. You know, a lot of the a lot of the episodes that I've seen over the years, you often have um, a a hopeful kind of idealistic. Uh, we're, you know, shooting off here, and we're dealing with the various problems we meet along the way. Uh, to have, I guess, something coming in from their own history that is also troubling, uh, you know, adds another dimension to it. I don't know. Maybe it just sort of uh, uh, increases its, um, I guess it adds other colors to a series like that. Uh, I like it. Do you guys like it? 
I love it. Oh, I I'm love a huge it. fan of Section 31 myself. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I would love to do it again. I mean, absolutely. I, I think when you're going in as a dark secret or, you you know, you have a maybe, uh, you know, you're shading plots that, uh, you know, people can debate over the years. I mean, people come in and they tell me about it. They tell me more about it than I knew. Mm-hmm. Like you guys could tell me more about it than I know. I'm not much for a conspiracy theorist and stuff, but I mean, I, I personally think that there are probably portions of our government, like I'm in Canada, and I think that even up in Canada, we probably have portions of our government that have to deal with situations like this, you know, uh, what's the term? Was it above board or below board? What would the term be? I don't know. Well, I, I loved your character on that, and I love the idea of it. I mean, if I'd have had my preference, it would you would have been on there, you know, like coaching an agent or somebody from the very get-go you know, as far as that show goes, you know. Yeah, I'm kind of but, interested as to how they brought it back and what, you know, what the thought process was with that. But I never heard because, uh, you know, once you're, you know, you're not really in the room, right? Uh, what you're getting each, each, uh, each script is, uh, you know, it shows up. Here's your script and this is what you're going to play. And you go in and you ask questions about it. And hopefully the director um, is completely, you know, clued in. Uh, because you know the, the powers that be are not necessarily on the set. The director's there, mm-hmm. so you're you know you're basically he knows enough, and you're asking him questions. Uh, and you know you 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 don't know as much as they know in the room. And because the writers, you know, I mean, I'm a writer, so I get it, you know. And you, but as an actor, what's cool about it is that you're taking the information, and on the day you are trying to create, you know, the life from this script and make it work as to the ongoing, especially as a guest star or recurring character, because um, you're it's like a baseball analogy. You're not getting up to bat all the time. You're coming in. And uh, so you don't really understand uh, all the nuances of it, but you're doing the best you can to try to get it out there. Um, it would be very cool, for example, in the next show, if I were contacted to say, we'd love you to play this kind of character again from the, from the start. And this is the arc Mm -hmm. because you don't know what the arc is, right? You're you're going in as a recurring character and you're kind of getting it each time you get another script. They're creating their story, their arcs, you know, uh, in the writing room in production. So like if I could go back to alien nation, for example, and we'll go back to Harris, when you're doing alien nation, um, you have this, in, this incredible, you know, all of these, uh, sort of historical things and ceremonies that the newcomers are doing and the writers are there and productions there and directors come in and they go, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> you know, I go, well, let's try this because these are guest directors. They're not really, uh, you know, they're not creating all of this. They're, they're in to direct that particular episode. And after you're doing them as a regular series star, you're, you're in it more than, you know, you're into it, your head, your body, whole soul, you're into it. So, you know, when you can create from dust, all of this, uh, for example, if when I signed on to do Alien Nation, did I know that I was actually going to give birth on national television? No. <laughs> right? <laughs> so here I am, and I get this like, wait a minute. You're saying the men give birth? When did this come in? <laughs> well, we just thought. You go, okay. So, yeah, okay. So here's what happened. Uh, first of all, your wife... Uh, is going to have to be impregnated by you and another guy. Okay, wait a minute, what? Okay, so it takes two males to impregnate a female. Yes, that's what we've decided. So I said, what woman in the room decided this? Okay, you're, yeah, you're right. Uh, it was Diane uh, decided that, Diane Froloff, I think. And so I was cracking up. I go, well, what happens now? Well, the pod, I go, there's a pod. Yeah. The pod gets transferred to you and you carry the pod to term and then you get birth through your marsupial pouch. Okay. 
and then you have to believe it. <laughs> okay. And then your partner has to help you deliver. <laughs> Okay, so now you have a bit of like weird stuff going on that my, uh, uh, you know, the children and, and, you know, my extended family thought was pretty gross uh, that Uncle Eric is like having birth on TV like this, you know, not to me, you know, so, all right, to go back to Harris. Okay, if I could give birth on national television, I could bloody well take the information that I'm giving on the day and do Harris, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. But I love doing Harris because I loved a sort of, uh, there was a, a very sort of mysterious, um, I don't know, dark urgency to uh, all of that. And um, it was, it was very cool to kind of go in and, and do that and, and uh, walk away and, and feel like you're affecting the show somehow. Um, so it was definitely, you know, if I had to pick all of the, the characters that I've done on Star Trek, uh, it was nice to, of course, play a Klingon because as I say, if you're going to do Star Trek, why not play a Klingon? But that's kind of a, you're one and done. Mm -hmm. And all those characters like Captain Sanders, you're, you're in there to advance the storyline of that particular episode. You're not affecting a series of episodes. So, um, so I would, uh, if I got to, you know, to go with your thought, you know, if we could start over, uh, had they contacted me to play Harris for most of the run of that show, I'd have been absolutely, uh, thrilled. Well, you left a good mark on that show because the uh, the writers of the novels that take place after the show ends, they, they continued on with the section 31 plot line in the books. So, well, I have to read one someday. I've never read one. Yeah, they're they're pretty good. So what has been your most rewarding acting experience? Well, uh, for me, Alien Nation, uh, I think, has been the most rewarding uh, television experience that I've had. And, 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 that's, and the reason is that you had very, very challenging experiences. Uh, and every day uh, met with um, a lot of laughs and a lot of creativity. And a lot, of, I mean, you're doing something like that as you talk to probably many of the uh, Star Trek actors uh, in your show. Uh, it's especially the ones that have been makeup guys that have makeup three or four o'clock in the morning. And if they're a regular, they're doing this for 16 hours a day. They have no other life going on. Uh, they do, it's, they can't, if they're working every day, all day like that, I mean, that's it. I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're taking your script home and you're working on the next day's, uh, you know, uh, show and you've got five or six scenes maybe, uh, to, uh, to work on and study. And you maybe you've had the script for a week. Uh, so you just keep, you know, putting it out there, but it's, um, I felt that, that that show for me and now it might, I might have a different answer. Had I been, uh, you know, had I been Riker or had I been uh, whatever, Cisco or whatever, you know, I might have a different answer for you. But that's the difference also between being, let's say, a guest star and a series star. But I've done so many over the years. I mean, I've I've done uh, roles on a lot of different uh, shows. I'm hot pursuit. I mean, I, I go as far back as I guess Hill Street Blues uh, and. I don't know if you guys even remember that show, but it was, you know, very, very kind of to the forefront of new drama, a new wave of drama from the seventies, late seventies on. Yeah. I was a bit young for that show myself, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, I know that, yeah, you've had some pretty, pretty impressive roles over your career. So well, and I hope there's a lot more left mm -hmm. and, you know, we, you just keep going. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's another show that, uh, it was just on, uh, that's coming out. Uh, see, so you I'm sure you guys get American TV up in Canada too, or do you, is there a delay or do you get this? It, we get a lot on satellite and stuff. Okay. So like, uh, history channel, uh, a show that I did the last show is called six and it's about seal team six. Uh, and it, I play the father of a, of a Navy seal who was killed in combat. It's an eight-part miniseries, but it could 
extend into a series uh, next year as well. It's going to air in, uh, I think, starting in January. Uh, and this SEAL Team 6 was the, you know, SEAL Team that uh, took down um, Osama bin Laden. So it's about these guys, and they go off and, you know, they're, they've got to do these, you know, horrific things, and they come back, and, uh, you know, they have their home lives as well. Uh, and the History Channel doesn't do much, uh, you know, uh, scripted television. I think they have Vikings that are that's on. Uh, they, you know, I'm not sure what else they're doing, but they're getting into it. Like a lot of others are getting into this now. So uh, we'll see what happens with that one. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, a, you know, an ongoing thing. You never know what really is going to show up. You are actually, you mentioned earlier, you're a writer. You're an author of young adult novels. So uh, tell our listeners a little bit about uh, the books that you've written. Yeah, um, I had written uh, several screenplays. And uh, one of the screenplays I was asked to uh, turn into a novel. Uh, and I write for uh, what are called middle readers, which are, it's kind of the upper end of middle and then the uh, younger end of uh, young adult YA. I write historical fiction. What I, I have a, you know, I call it inspirational action adventure historical fiction. So the central character of both books, there's two books, one is called The Last Ride of Caleb O'Toole. And that is a story about, um, a young boy, 12 years old, and his two sisters in the middle of Kansas. Uh, his parents, uh, Caleb's parents, uh, are uh, die from a cholera epidemic. It's um, 1873, and the dying words of the mother is to for Caleb to get his two sisters and somehow get them to a relative up in the Montana Territory. And how do they do it? And all the dangers along the way. So he has to go from being this average kid uh, in the middle of Kansas to learning all of these skills in order to survive. And um, uh, a lot of twists and turns along the way. The second book actually goes, uh, you know, back into the Revolutionary War, uh, into uh, 1781, before the Battle of Yorktown and the secret mission of William Tuck. Uh, and he's a boy whose older brother has been killed by British. And he, you know, is at a, you know, in order to, you know, seek some kind of, uh, say revenge, but value in his life and avenge the loss of his brother. He, he gets his drum and goes off to be a drummer boy. And in his very first battle, he's blown off of his feet and he ends up next to a dying man who ends, who's is a courier, a spy, who has a secret message that's got to go all the way to George Washington. And the spy, the courier, gives him this message, and he has to figure out how to do it. And he uh, he partners up with uh, a slightly older girl, the two of them together go off on this great adventure, uh, one step ahead of British spies. So that's the gist of both of them. and. What has resulted from that is uh, really, really wonderful uh, tours that I do all across the country. So as a writer now, I'm busy uh, doing school tours. So I go into um, various schools, uh, various states, and I will sit in front of, you know, three or 400 kids sitting cross-legged on a gym floor. And I'll do presentations for them, right? So I have a whole PowerPoint presentation going off on the screen behind me. And I go through all of these things. And we talk about all kinds of stuff. And I, I ask for volunteers. And I bring them up. And I, you know, we talk about anything from frontier medicine to, you know, how do you hide a secret message? And, all, you know, and what is historical fiction? And I talk to their teachers. And it's really trying to... Uh, connect with kids in a way using all of the you know history that I've had as a storyteller and as an actor and now as a writer to entertain and educate and get them excited and it's like when the teachers say to me oh my god they're reading <laughs> you know you feel like you've really uh, done your job and so I'm working on a third book now which is about the civil war but after all of that 
I have a um, a very strong idea. I've got out to my publisher right now about a science fiction uh, trilogy. I won't blow it because I don't want anybody stealing it. So, you know, just in case anybody is going to be listening that. to, you know, you know, oh, guys, that's oh, that sounds like a great idea. Then all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, you got twenty people working on the same thing. Um, but I think that what I what I think is really important in my writing is uh, to also bring diversity into it. So I, you know, put a lot of different uh, historical as well as fictional characters of diverse backgrounds and races and, and um, into uh, these books and with science fiction. I mean, that is fertile ground for that. You have so many other, not only, you know, humans, but aliens. And so, God, you could just keep going on and on and on. Plus the invention process rather than, you know, the historical process is a little bit different. But you do, would have to educate yourself on space travel, on planets, on ideas, and see what's been working and, you know, come up with new stuff. Uh, so I think as a writer, I'm going to be pretty busy. Uh, so I have these, you know, two careers that I'm kind of working at the same time. And then when one takes over, I kind of try to put the other one aside. And then when that's done, I go back to the other. Uh, so that's, it keeps me going. I'm telling you. Must be very rewarding. I've seen your pictures on uh, Facebook and it looks like you're having a blast reading to the kids in the classrooms and stuff. <laughs> oh God. I, you know, to me it's, it is so cool. Uh, because when, like I had a, one girl tell her grandfather, my, you know, one of the great notices on Facebook that I got uh, is that a guy, call, you know, got on Facebook and there was a picture of him. His name was Don and he lives in San Diego and um, he was in a, on a hospital bed and his uh, grandchild was sitting there in front of him and they were holding up both of my books. I thought, wow, that's him, you know, and then I contacted him and he contacted me back and one thing led to another. And he said that his, uh, his grandchild's granddaughter was reading, uh, the last ride of Caleb O'Toole very slowly. And so it's, aren't you finished with the book? No, I'm reading it slowly. Why are you reading it slow? Cause I don't want it to end. Oh. And I thought that's the biggest compliment I have ever, so cute. you know, so I mean, it's one cute. thing like, yeah, that was great. I couldn't put it down. There was another thing like, I only wanted to read it a little bit at a time because I don't want it to end. Right. I mean, I, what? That's great. Like, what can we do now? So one thing led to another and I learned that, um, her school was an underserved, uh, school. Um, and that they didn't have money. Uh, so I went on a fundraiser, another one, I've done one for each book and had people contribute and people, you know, pulled through and they contributed enough money to be, for me to be able to take down, uh, how many did we take on a couple hundred books, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went down, drove them, down, drove down there and they were all delivered. And uh, I got a hotel room the next morning, uh, went to the school, and they had everybody again, you know, like sitting around uh, in chairs and on the floor, and we had a blast. Uh, and in L.A., we have an area, South L.A., uh, there's a school there called 107th Street Elementary. Again, underserved school, and um, in, a, in you know, a very uh, rough section of town, I would say. And it was a great school with great teachers there. And it was, you know, these kids were all, you know, just absolutely wide eyed and ready. And we, again, we did the same thing in fundraiser in a couple of schools we brought books to, and I went down last year. And again, this past year, I find it very inspirational to me. You know, I loved it. And this last time I went down and instead of having, uh, you know, 400 kids all at once, I went to, and did five different presentations at five different classrooms. And I was exhausted by that day. 
but it was, uh, you know, it's very rewarding for me. I actually have a, a 10 year old son and a seven year old son. And I have to say that your books sound like they're right in their wheelhouse. Like they, we're definitely going to be checking that out. Yeah, uh, middle readers, uh, you know, and if they're, uh, are, you have, are they a boy and a girl or what? It's uh, two boys and we're, we'll definitely be checking it out because they love books like that. Like the historical fiction, like you're talking about. Well, it's so a the, lot of action to keep them going because the, one of the things you cannot do is bore kids. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. They just won't read it, you know. And I was given that advice by my uh, lit agent as well as my publisher, you know, keep it moving. And especially for boys, you know. And there's not as much out there for boys. I don't know if you found this yet, but there's a little more going on for girls than there are for boys as far as books are concerned. But yeah, can you come up with something that they'll read that they'll find interesting, but at the same time, you know, learn something. Well, what other projects are you currently working on and uh, where can people find you and follow you? Where can people buy your books? Well, uh, they can follow me. Uh, they can always bump into my website, which is uh, at ericpierpoint.net. And they can see a lot of stuff that's going on, you know, what I'm doing as an actor and what I'm doing with the kids and all that stuff with the books. The books are everywhere. You can you can go either uh, order them at bookstores. If they're not there, you can order them. Or you can go on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, and uh, so, yeah, tell your listeners to go out and, you know, and check them out, especially if um, they want something that's, you know, does not have vampires in it. <laughs> you know, although vampires are fine. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> They're just not in my books. Uh, and, you know, as far as um, uh, my acting career goes, I told you about uh, six. Mm -hmm. So that's coming up. Uh, and uh, I've got a, believe it or not, a science fiction audition for a, I can't tell you what it is. I've been sworn to secrecy, but... Mm -hmm. Uh, I have a meeting on something that's very funny uh, that uh, uh, is going to air this, uh, you know, January. So we'll see about that. Um, and then each day, you know, we'll just see what what comes along. So the life of an actor, you're a little bit of a gypsy. Um, and, you know, the guys from Star Trek, you know, I was just in England, saw a lot of the guys there, uh, Enterprise. And, you know, with same thing with them, you know, you, you talk to them and uh, they're all going, okay, now what? <laughs> you know, some, sometimes you can get into this act of paranoia that, you know, at this point in life, I've seen it enough that I don't want to ever go there again. You know, it's like, oh my God, am I ever going to work again? That kind of thing. Yeah, you will, you know, you will, don't worry about it. But when you are, uh, you know, when you've done something like Star Trek and let's say you've been on it for a number of years. Uh, it's su it has such a following that it's always a pleasure uh, for people to to then go, let's say, go to conventions and be reminded by uh, you know people wandering around dressed like you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they love it. I mean, they have this whole this great love of uh, Star Trek. I have a kind of a funny story about that because um, we can all make fun of science fiction geeks, you know, fans, but we're all, we all love this. We all love it. And we make fun kind of with an open heart. Uh, but there was one uh, convention I went to, I want to say 15 years ago in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. And it was a supposed to be, in fact, I thought, was that the Klingon? No. Oh, no, it was a different one, but I went there and there was a blizzard. The first day, the first night went fine, but it snowed about three feet. So the National Guard was out and uh, blocked off the roads. Nobody could go anywhere. So people were stranded for about three days at this hotel, dressed as, you know, in Star Trek characters. There's nowhere to go. They're sleeping in the hallways. So you saw everyone, and you've seen it, right? Everyone dressed up as whatever their favorite Star Trek character was. There were a lot of Klingons. There were Star Wars uh, contingent. And um, it 
start to kind of take on this certain weird Star Wars bar kind of thing, you know, <laughs> where where people are, are caught. They can't go anywhere. They're running out of food. And the only thing to do was to go to the bar, the lounge, where you would have people sitting around still like their costumes are being are a little gamey by this time. Uh, they didn't bring clothes. Uh, so they were trapped in, you know, they're sitting there with their lightsabers next to their martinis and, you know, whatever. So it, it was, it was pretty funny. And then finally everybody was re- released, but I'm sure that most of the food there by the you know end of the second day was like, uh, you know, peanuts and cocktails. That's great. And you cleaned them out. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so anyway, that's it, it, the life of an actor and the life of a, you know, of science fiction fans. And um, it's great. I guess it, this is a big year for Star Trek uh, 50th anniversary. And, uh, you know, I, I only did one, uh, the convention, which was in uh, England. And they had about, uh, I don't know, 12, 15,000 people there mm-hmm. uh, all having a great time. And and the British fans are just as into it as anybody else. Yeah. So th- thank you so much, Eric, for coming on. Um, we really appreciate you coming aboard here. I mean, well, my pleasure. Really, you are welcome on in Warp Five anytime. You know, no matter what, whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> okay. Well, why don't we connect? You know, in a, you know, in a few months or something like that, we'll do it again. All right, Brandon. That was excellent. We actually met with the Section 31 agent Harris, I, a.k.a. Eric Pierpoint. That was amazing. Thank, That was great. What do you think about that? That was a lot of fun. He told some really fun stories about, you know, being an actor and getting some different roles and how to do the audition process. Um, honestly, though, uh, hearing about his new books it actually intrigues me because uh, I've read a few books to my daughter. We like to sit down and read together. So I think I'm going to have to pick up his, uh, his two books and... Uh, have some fun reading them with my six-year-old daughter. Oh, yeah. that That's going to be easy for me with my two sons. That just sounds like that would be right. Perfect for them. And then also, he almost played Cisco and Janeway. He um, almost played Janeway. Have, <laughs> <laughs> I, they may have. I don't know if they'd have. I don't, Catherine, Kate. Uh, let's see. What could have been his name? I don't know. It Chris. probably would have been in into with Janeway. What was Janeway's... Uh, fiance's name mark or never mind never yeah. mind <laughs> he thought giving birth to an alien was weird well just <laughs> with seven years as a female captain right <laughs> the makeup the makeup he you know transforming him although he, he actually already has experience with that is on on the original series or uh the next generation he already has a has experience with it. Kind so. of, yeah. So the the episode that he was talking about was Liaisons from Season 7. Uh, so he was on Liaisons. Uh, he was on uh, uh, Barge of the Dead uh, from Voyager. Yep. and he was uh, from For the Uniform on DS9. Yep, yep. And, and then, then Rogue- Voyager, or, or sorry, Enterprise. He was on uh, four episodes as uh, as Harris, and then he was on Rogue Planet. So. so yeah, meeting with Section 31 agents is not the only thing we've been doing on Trek FM this week. So here's what else you may have missed elsewhere on the network. Previously on Trek.FM, Standard Orbit. Don't watch any of the extras on the first disc because they're all duplicated over the second disc. So then it, that way you can just watch them in order and not have to worry about, oh, well, let me skip this one because I watched it on the first disc and do all that. Wait, to clarify, they have all the special features in column A on one disc. And then all the special features of column A plus column B on a second disc? That is correct. That makes no (laughs) sense to me at all. (laughs) I know. I was very confused when I sat down to watch it. Melodic Treks. Matter? I bury nowhere. Oh, it's painful. I don't know. You snowing me? You snowing me? Painful just saying Remus and blah, blah. I felt myself falling asleep. I felt like it was my parents were telling me a good night story where you were giving me that track listings there that... Like, Does it still I mean, McFly? That's oh. that's one of my favorite ones. Stage 9, a podcast about the people who make Star Trek. Within about 15 seconds, you texted me back, Dr. Giggles, we have to do Dr. Giggles. And my question for you is, yes. why did we 
absolutely have to do <laughs> Dr. Giggles. Saturday Morning Trek. And all these things just brought in more and more people who thought they were alone, and they found each other, and they made their clubs, and they, then they made conventions. and that just That's what the 70s were about, was getting Star Trek back and finding each other. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out these shows and find out what we're talking about in your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe. You can find us on iTunes, TuneIn, or anywhere you can get your podcasts. And if you want to just go to our website at trek.fm, you can download the MP3 file or grab the RSS link. And if you're an Apple user, please hit that subscribe button and get write us a review and a rating. That's some we we always love hearing from our fans and that helps us increase visibility for new listeners. Another way you can help us is keep all of our shows coming to you each week is to become a patron of the network on Patreon. So patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm. You can find all of our current goals and milestones and you can help us keep the Warp 5 and all the Trek FM shows coming to your radio. Uh, We're a listener supported uh, network and every little bit helps and we surely would appreciate it. That's you can get more details at patreon.com slash Trek FM. Also, if you want to wear your Trek FM fandom, you can find great Trek FM themed merchandise at Trek store. So Brandon, do you have any Christmas list items that are going to be coming from the Trek FM store or what, what, what do you got going on? Well, not from the Trek FM store, but if anybody wants to buy me Eric Pierpoint's new books, uh, that'd be great. Um, if not, you know, a Trek FM shirt would be nice too. A yeah, throw pillow. Hey, what about what about both? You could just wrap the books with a Trek FM shirt. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Floyd. Uh oh, uh oh. So yeah, I also want to thank uh, co associate producer Mike Morrison. You can find Mike on the Babel Conference, Trek FM's Facebook listeners group. You can also hear Mike over on Metatrex, where he and his co-host Zachary Freerling discuss all things philosophical through a Star Trek lens. I'd also like to thank Brandon Shea. For taking over the reins of editing and publishing Warp 5. Thank you so much, Brandon. We surely appreciate that. Yeah, you're very welcome. It's been a lot of fun. It's it's way easier editing Warp 5 than it is editing melodic tracks, that's for sure. Yeah, I saw you said that. (laughs) I I can I can bet. So that that's that's cool. I like that. And thank you so much, because I I know it it takes a little bit. All we all do this on a volunteer basis, and we really appreciate Brandon taking care of the editing for us on this. Also, I like to thank Tony Robinson. He hooks us up with very cool show art, and that that's how everybody gets to see what we've got going on. When they, whenever you click on the link or you see our link, it's usually got our show art. It's the first thing that you see. So thank you so much, Tony. If you'd like to get in touch with us here at Trek FM, you can always find us on trek.fm slash contact and look on the sh- sidebar on the show page, or you can go to speakpipe.com slash trek.fm. You can also contact us through Twitter at trek.fm, Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm, and as we mentioned, the Babel Conference. Type the Babel Conference, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, or go to our website at trek.fm and click discussion on the menu bar. So thank you so much, Brandon. You set that interview up. You've got uh, the contact with the Section 31 agent. Uh, so far, I don't feel like anyone's looking over my shoulder. Uh, but, you know, I'll, I'm going to be I'm gonna be watching for the next week or two to make sure that uh, I'm not being followed. Yeah, if I could just give you some advice. Um, don't go downtown next Friday at 2 p.m. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I just won't be on this planet. How's that? <laughs> I'll just... I'll just <laughs> Sounds good. Riza, here I come. All right. So, yeah, Brandon, if uh, anyone wants to contact you to see if you can also set up some clandestine uh, meetings, uh, how can they get in touch with you? Uh, In dark alleys, of course. That's the best place to find me. Uh, However, when I'm not in dark alleys, you can find me here on the network with new episodes of Melodic Treks, which is all about the music of Star Trek. Uh, You can find me on Twitter at Brandon Matella, and you can find me every once in a while in the Babel Conference poking my head up. And uh, Floyd, where can people find you? You can always get in touch with me in the Babel Conference, uh, Trek FM listeners page on Facebook. Um, that's I have a Twitter, but I don't actually use it. So, yep, Babel Conference, Facebook, that's the best place to find me. So, Boomers, thank you so much for listening. And join us again next time for another episode of Warp 5. Warp 5.